All right, hello, lovely humans. Jen Foxbot here. Welcome to another edition of Math Mondays. Da 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 da. Yeah. All right. In this episode, we are going to figure out how to read equations written in the language of math. Oh yeah. So I'm breaking this into two parts. I'm actually redoing this part. Shh. There's a buzz on the video track, and there's a couple things I want to update. So that's fine. Anyway, so this first part, we are going to look at the language of mathematics in general with a specific focus on the addition sign, how we have had it, had it, <laughs> that's funny, how we have had to add the summation sign as well as the integral sign and how they relate to one another. And then in part two, we'll look at a specific equation and what happens when we apply mathematics to the world around us, whether it be the physical world or the digital world of computers, how we have to incorporate concepts into our understanding of the mathematical language so that we can make sure that our symbols have the proper context for our understanding to be correct. Okay, so language. Woohoo! There are many different types of languages. I am speaking English right now. English is made up of a series of symbols called letters, A, B, C, D, E, etc. And those symbols, those letters, they represent sounds. When we put those letters together, then we can have words and phrases. And these words, you know, they could be something like a specific thing or a person. They can represent an idea like love or imagination. Um, it could be a description and all sorts of other things. As we have need for it, we can also invent new words. But all of those uh, words and those, those meanings of words are based out of the symbols from our alphabet. So that alphabet is really, really versatile and it can be something as complex and intangible as love or it could be something as straightforward as a piece of chalk. Cool. If I wanted to invent my own language, I could say, okay, well, I'm gonna write some symbols that maybe haven't been written before, although at this day and age, there's nothing new under the sun, so they say. But anyway, so maybe my symbols start to look like this. And then uh, these symbols, I have to now ascribe meaning to them for them to really have any value. Well, I guess they could have value outside of that, but to have meaning then I have to say, okay, what do these actually mean? An easy way to go would be to map these symbols to an existing language. And since the only language that I'm fluent in is English, I could say, okay, well, let's say this is A, B, and C. So like some of us did when we were kids, I could create my own secret coding language and I could teach my friends these symbols, assuming I went all the way to Z, and then we could read, write, and maybe speak using these symbols instead of our standard English. So that is how we give symbols meaning. We ascribe to them a specific sound or maybe a specific thing that it means, and then all of a sudden we can build off of that. So math is just the exact same way, but instead of letters, we have numbers. So our numeric digits start from zero and goes all the way up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So we have a base 10 number system. That means that we have 10 digits, and once we count to 10, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, then we start over and we add more digits to represent that we have a bigger number. If we had five fingers on our hands, we would probably have a base five number system. Or if most humans had only two fingers, boop, 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 then we would probably have a base two or a binary counting system. And really what that means is we can still count up to the same quantities, but we are just going to use different symbols to represent that. So numbers are just symbols that represent quantities. Okay, so now because we're talking about mathematics, we also have operations. And operations act on the quantities and tell us how these quantities uh, change based on the operation. So for example, we have addition and subtraction. And then eventually we learn multiplication and division. But 
at the end of the day, multiplication and division are really just simple or lazy ways for us to do addition and subtraction. I want to really dive into addition because that's something that humans have been doing for a very long time. Adding up quantities of things and then figuring out how much of that thing we have it is a pretty, pretty useful operation. And so if we were to say, okay, well, um, what is five times five? Really, multiplication is just a way to make it easier for us to write five plus five, five times. Or in other words, five plus five plus five plus five plus five. So one, two, three, four, five. We are adding five together five times. This is gonna be 10, 10 plus five is 15, 15 plus five is 20, and 20 plus five is 25. And so now we have five, five times equals 25. No big deal. But instead of having to write all of this out, we can be lazy and just use the multiplication symbol to do some quick addition for us. But the multiplication symbol doesn't always cut it. Sometimes we need something a little bit more advanced. What if we have a large number of things and we wanna add a bunch of it together? Okay, so that's where the summation sign comes into play. The summation sign looks something like this. It kind of, to me, it looks like it's trying to eat the thing on the right side, which I think is really cute. Um, so we would represent five times five like this, where we have the number five subscript I. I basically just tells us where we are in the addition sum. And so I would say, we are going to add five starting from one and go all the way to five. So what this would look like is five subscript one, and then I into um, or I add one to i, and so now I have five subscript two. That just means that it is my second five, plus five subscript three, or my third five, plus five subscript four, and lastly five subscript five. And now i equals five. So in this case, i equals one, i equals two i equals three, and so on. For those of you who program, you'll recognize this as our friend, the for loop. So for i equals one to five, just add five each time. We are adding one to i every time we go. So i can only be integers or whole numbers. And this just equals 25. Did this save us some space aside from writing five times five? Is that shorter? Eh, maybe. Um, but what is really useful is if you want to have something that's a little bit longer than this or a little bit more complicated um, than just using the multiplication sign. So for example, if we said the summation from i equals one to five of one over i, then that means that our index just goes in the denominator of this fraction. So it would be like one over one plus one half plus one third plus one fourth plus one fifth. And I'll let you add that because I'm not gonna do fractions in my head. Anyway, so uh, the summation sign allows us to do addition that's a bit more complicated, but write it in a way that's compact and clean. Cool, but what if we wanna add something together that's continuous, that's not these nice, clean, whole number integers? That is where the integral comes in, yes. So this is why calculus is super cool, is because it's really just an extension of these same basic operations. And just to return to the fact that math is a language, what we are doing is we are trying to understand what these operations mean and how they act on our quantities, aka numbers. So the integral, is really just a summation or a sum that is continuous. So if I wanted to represent five times five using an integral, what I would do is I would say, okay, well, we're going from zero to five of five with respect to dx. Um, so the integral, there are two main parts in the integral. Well, I should say there are three main parts. The first is the integral sign. This is called a definite integral, meaning that there are bounds to it. There is a starting point, zero, and an ending point, five. You might have an indefinite integral where there's no starting and ending point, but in that case, um, you kind of, s well, okay, I won't really get into that, but if you have questions, let me know. So definite integral, starting, ending, indefinite, indefinite integral, 
no starting and ending point. It's a little bit more general. Then you have your function in between, which I'm gonna call a function of f of x. Don't be worried that we don't see an x in here. Really, that just means um, that this is um, the function with which we are uh, taking the integral over. And then this last part is, um, we're always gonna see this little d here, but then this, this x, is the variable by which we are taking the integral with respect to. So this could really be anything. I could say that this is d alpha, I could say that this is d square, I could say that this is d little person, or maybe I draw a little octopus, but I don't wanna draw eight legs, so whatever, okay. It could be anything as long as I am consistent. To better understand this, let's draw a picture because pictures are super helpful when we are trying to read mathematics. Especially because if you're like me, I think a lot in pictures and drawing a picture helps me to connect the symbols to an image. So what this looks like, if X is on our horizontal axis and our function is on the vertical axis, our function is just five. So for all values of x, whether x is negative infinity, 100, or five, f of x is always going to be five. And so here is where I say this is five. And I can label my graph however I want because I am making it, so it doesn't have to be uh, to scale. But anyway, as long as I tell you what it is. So this is the positive value five for all values of x, regardless of what we pick x to be, our function is always going to equal five. And so at our origin, we have x equals zero, and let's say that x equals five here. So our definite integral is summing, oops, kinda missed my index, okay. Um, our definite integral is summing from x equals zero to x equals five, which basically means that we are taking the sum over this area. That's all an integral is. So for those of you that are like, wait a second, that's the area of a square or a rectangle if it wasn't five. Yes, exactly. So we are going to use our knowledge of integrals to actually do this operation, which is going to give me five X from zero to five. And now we plug in our definite bounds or our interval. So we have five times five minus five times zero, which is just 25, look at that. And so if you notice, we have our function f of x, which is going to be, give us this distance, whoops, sorry. That's gonna be the vertical distance equals five. And the horizontal distance is going to be x equals five because five minus zero equals five. So integrals are just a sum but we had to add them to our repertoire of operations because addition and even multiplication and even our fancy schmancy summation sign were not quite enough to do all of the operations that we needed to do once we got to a certain level of understanding of not only mathematics, but the physical world around us. So just to recap, math is a language. As my physics professor said, don't let the symbols push you around, you push the symbols around. So we really just have to make sure that we understand what those symbols are, whether they are our quantities or whether it is something standing in for a quantity like X or alpha or I don't know, dog symbol. Okay, okay, that sort of looks like a dog. <laughs> So it doesn't really matter as long as we are clear what is a quantity and what is an operation. And with the operations, we just have to understand what those operations mean, how they act on different quantities, how they interact with other operations, what the order is, AKA if I have like three squared times five, which do I do first? Um, and if there are any other rules that we need to keep in mind. So in the same way that we learn whatever language we happen to speak, whether it be English or Farsi or Mandarin, we have to learn the rules of the language, how we combine sounds and words together so that we can speak things that make sense to ourselves and to other people. Math is the same way. Uh, cool, so that's it for the general discussion of math as a language. Let me know if you have any questions about what we did here or if there are particular mathematical symbols 
um, operations that you have questions about, I'm happy to tackle that. So check out part two to learn more about one of the most famous equations ever written. Yes. And uh, please, if you like this video and you want to keep seeing more of these, check out my Patreon and consider supporting so I can spend my time and energy on this. Thank you very much. Okay, check out part two. Yay, bye.